The chimney sweep, despite being romanticized in modern popular media, was, in fact, one of the most difficult, hazardous, and low-paying occupations of the Victorian era. Not only was it a dirty job, but it carried huge risks, often for the boys that were apprentices to a master sweep, for only they were small enough to navigate the narrow flues of townhouses. From the constant risk of fire catching a building alight, being trapped and suffocated to the myriad detrimental effects on bodily health, the life of a chimney sweep was hard, poorly paid, and sometimes all too short. But, as if that wasn't hard enough a life to lead, for some boys in 19th century London, even to make it to adulthood and be in receipt of a profession was no mean achievement. The story you're going to hear is an account of one such Victorian chimney sweep, from apprentice boy to master sweep, and the dreadful choices and challenges he faced in life. The account is taken from... Street Life in London, 1877, by John Thompson and Adolf Smith, and is narrated in the words of Smith. Thompson was a talented and influential photographer who joined with Smith, a journalist, in a project to photograph the street life of London's poor. The authors were careful not to varnish their words for an audience. What they saw and heard accurately reflects their interactions with everyday people and genuinely immerses the reader in authentic Victorian street life. You can check the in-video cards and description for links to more interesting videos about the Victorians. In particular, we have Street Life in London from the same authors which opens a window on more genuinely wonderful characters from Victorian London and the hard lives they led. Do check it out. Before we start, please consider clicking the subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. These two things really do show your support and help the channel grow so I can bring you more. Thank you. Born in Lambeth, the son of a road mender, John Day was sent out to work when scarcely more than 10 years old. His father was decidedly addicted to drink and was in the habit of taking his son on Sunday to public houses, where drink was sold in defiance of the Licensing Act. So long as the child had a few halfpence for beer, he was in the parental eyes a good boy. But when his meagre earnings had been thus uselessly spent, his father came to the conclusion that he could not afford to keep him, and that it was high time the boy should fight his own way in the world. He was therefore turned out of his home and had to resort to the friendly, if cheerless, shelter of railway arches or at times he would sleep on a barge and profited by the opportunity to wash his solitary shirt in the canal and hang it on the rigging of his temporary home, while he disported himself amidst the tarpaulin till it dried. At times when there was nothing to be done at the flour mill, he obtained a little work as assistant to a neighboring chimney sweep, but in either employ he rarely made more than three shillings per week. At last, Day's parents, stirred to a sense of the protection they owed to their son, determined to find him some more satisfactory employment, and they arranged that he should follow an itinerant fish hawker in his travels, and for this he was to receive a fair remuneration. Accordingly, the hawker and boy started and tramped to Farnham in Kent, but here the man left his young charge with tuppence and orders to join him at Kingston. Alone with a coster barrow to drag along, the poor boy started on his journey, barefooted, till he met a farmer who gave him a pair of old boots twice too big for his slender feet. On reaching Kingston, he found 
that his employer had failed to keep the appointment. Hungry, penniless, and drenched with the rain, Day had to sleep on his barrow in the open air and covered with one or two wet sacks. On the morrow, however, fortune dawned upon him. Some compassionate cabmen subscribed a penny each to procure breakfast for the boy, and a gentleman who happened to be passing gave him eighteen pence to carry his fishing rod to a neighbouring stream. After loitering some time longer at Kingston, Day at last met his employer and continued in his service for five weeks, but failed to obtain any wages or clothes, nor even a change of linen. Footsore, in rags, and in a state of incomparable filth, Day, at last, made up his mind to abandon such unprofitable work and started for home. At Battersea, he passed by a potato field where he obtained some small potatoes, which he sold for a penny and therefore procured himself a slice of pudding. Thus fortified, he once more made his entrance into the great metropolis, but as he neared home and met some friends, the boy's pride brought tears to his eyes when he noticed how they stared at the sorry appearance he presented. Even his parents were moved, and his mother actually gave him her own boots to wear. As Day grew older, he inherited his father's propensity for strong liquor and was often arrested for drunken and disorderly conduct. On these occasions, he took special delight in fighting the police. And when finally incarcerated, his clothes had generally been torn to pieces in the previous struggle. The bounty money offered for volunteers to join the Crimean army and the prospect of an adventurous career ultimately inflamed his desperate and reckless character, and he enlisted for the campaign. He was enrolled in the Transport Corps, served in the trenches before Sebastopol, where he fell ill with fever. The danger of this disease was increased by his intemperate habits. He remembers on one occasion spending together with three other soldiers two pounds in drink, and on this they succeeded in attaining that extreme stage of intoxication which rendered medical assistance indispensable, or their lives might have been sacrificed. On his return from the seat of war, Day's parents seemed once more to have shown some feeling, for, to use his own words, Father began to cry at seeing me, and of course I sent for beer, and that soon stopped the crying. This burst of affection was, however, of short duration, and when the soldier had spent all his money, he was again turned out of his home, and again resumed his old calling as chimney sweep. He then happened to meet a man who used to clean the pans and boilers at a candle factory, but who was generally so intoxicated that he could not do the work, and consequently employed Day in his stead, giving him about quarter of the money. In time, however, he was forced into the workhouse, and Day succeeded to the post, which is worth about two pounds per month. Though Day received so little from his predecessor, he nevertheless allowed him three shillings a week while he remained in the workhouse. But he soon died, and this miserable end, together with his previous experience, served as another warning of the evils of intemperance. Day, nevertheless, continued to drink steadily till 1864, when Garibaldi came to Nine Elms. Day celebrated the occasion by getting even more drunk than usual. But on the morrow, while intent on resuming his libations, he chanced to obtain a glimpse of his own countenance reflected in a public house mirror. His bleared eyes his distorted features and ignominious, degraded appearance produced so sudden and forcible an impression that he turned round to his friends, confessed 
that he had wasted his life, was but a miserable fool, called for a penny glass of beer, and swore that it should be the last. Of course, they merely laughed and jeered, and thought he had not yet recovered from the excesses of the previous night. But to his credit, be it said, John Day was true to his word, and from that time he never again touched any intoxicating liquor, or even smoked a pipe of tobacco. The latter, he assured me, was the most difficult to abandon. To this newly acquired sobriety, monetary prosperity soon ensued. He is now the happy father of a large family. He lives in a house near Lambeth Walk, where he once humbly worked in the capacity of a mere assistant. As a master sweep, he has an extensive connection. The money he earns enables him to subscribe to several benefit societies, and he is entitled to receive from them ten shillings a week in sickness, while his wife will have forty-six pounds given her at his death, or he will receive eighteen pounds should she die first. Altogether, he is both prosperous and respected throughout the neighbourhood, where he ardently advocates the cause of total abstinence, and is well known as the Temperance Sweep. Chimney sweeps of the present day have lost one important source of income, the soot they so carefully collected and had to sift from the cinders and ashes taken away from the grate at the same time has no longer any great marketable value. It was used extensively on meadow and on wheat land, where it was especially beneficent in its effects by destroying slugs and other injurious animals. As much as a shilling a bushel was therefore given for soot, but the recent introduction of new manures has reduced the price of soot to about threepence or fourpence per bushel. As a natural result, the sweepers charge more for cleaning chimneys, the price varying from sixpence to two shillings or three shillings, according to the height of the chimney and the probable wealth of the persons who inhabit the house, while five shillings is generally given for putting out a fire. The assistant or journeyman sweeps receive six shillings a week and board and lodging, or about one pound a week, and keep themselves. And there must be altogether upwards of two thousand persons earning their living by sweeping the chimneys of the metropolis.